I'm a celebrated skier, folks, and qualified to smirk. I've skied more hills than any man from Frisco to New York. But talking about the skiing I've done is my one and only quirk, especially when I'm... I th yeah, we, we saw, we've seen individuals, particularly this one lady I do remember, that, that bought everything. You know, she bought the skis, she bought the, bought the boots, she bought the whole outfit. And uh, uh, she got a, a ski instructor to go over to, uh, to Buttermilk to teach her how to ski a half day lesson, you know, half day lesson. And then she, that she did that just to get to Cloud Nine, you know, to, to go up to the top and, and to partake in the party. It really developed with the times over the last couple of years that it's becoming this hip thing to spray champagne on each other. Uh, we do had, however, some pretty some pretty spirited parties, and let's put it that way. It happens at Cloud9, it stays at Cloud9. We have a, we have a saying in Sweden called Hunde Himlen, which means the seventh heaven, which is essentially Cloud9 or, you know, Heaven 17. It's, it, yeah. It, so Cloud9 was, a, you know, the English, English word of that, but I, I, like, I like what it, it's very, it's it's a very fitting name for for uh, for that place. It really is. We moved here in 1960, so Highlands was only two years old. It was 58 when it started, and uh, my dad took us back up there um, during those years. And I remember the original restaurant that was at Cloud Nine, um, and uh, uh, I really fell in love with that mountain in particular. Uh, it had a different feel. Aspen Mountain was the kids and the people that were there were were interesting, but they weren't really quite as local or homegrown as I was. And I kind of drifted off and found my my niche there at Highlands. I fell in love with it at, in high school, and I knew that that was going to be a place that I was going to spend a lot of my time. And I went to college, figured that wasn't for me either. I wanted to be a ski bum. I figured it out and. Uh, uh, came and washed dishes at the Mary Brown restaurant for one year for Freddie Never Pierce. And then the next year, next year I got on the ski patrol. And uh, our uh, introduction of that was uh, into the patrol building in which uh, the Cloud Nine restaurant is now. And uh, uh, we, we were in the north half of it and then the south half was a wine and cheese picnic. And the, uh, the difference was back in those days that uh, that if you had 10 or more people that were invited from, from WIP, you could you'd get a free picnic, picnic thing. And uh, we as a patrol, we started doing a, uh, uh, a show there. In other words, we started jumping the deck. And that deck um, jump started in 73 and went on till 93. For, for 20 years, uh, we jumped the deck probably sometimes up to 80 times a year and put on shows. And it was really cool to be part of that energy of that building. You know, you say my life on Cloud Nine. Well, that was it. It was a, it was a, uh, a place that uh, brings back fond memories from all the things we did there because we were young men, young men in a time of Aspen that was very interesting to be a young man in Aspen, and it was uh, uh, um, a place that had always been somewhat different. It is the, a maverick. It is. Uh, a, just a little bit unhinged sometimes, and we uh, uh, we were graced with uh, people that understood that and allowed us pretty much to be ourselves. You know, uh, we knew that we had a job to do. We had you know we had guests that needed to be taken care of. We had avalanche control work that needed to be done. So every day we went about our business, but we also had an opportunity to interact with the guests because of the of putting on the show and because of the wine and cheese picnics and. As young men, you couldn't wait for the, some of the, the college groups to get there during the spring breaks and that kind of stuff because it was a lot of fun. There was a restaurant that Whip built up there in 1963, and uh, it was really a showcase at that point in time. You know, it was uh, up at a high elevation. It had a great view of the Bells and Pyramid and uh, that whole valley up there and all down valley, all the way down to Sopris, you know. So you really got to see a beautiful view. Uh, I think it was a very... Uh, uh, enjoyed restaurant at the time, but it was very short-lived. It burnt down in 1967, and uh, shortly thereafter, there was a 
a little patrol shack was there for about four years. Uh, the patrolman made a jump right outside the door there and they did their own, just for their own entertainment, they jumped. And then in 1971, the building was put in there. You know, the building we know of is now is Cloud Nine. And that building uh, just is, I don't know, almost historic in a way that, that may, very few things can be, you know. People can be, but things like that are not usually historic. But there's something about that building, something about that place that uh, people let their hair down. It's like a place that they can really have fun. And it started back in those days, like I said, we started with the wine and cheese picnics and, uh, and jumping the deck and, uh, and heck, we, we took down people that uh, couldn't ski or were, were maybe a little bit overserved back then in toboggans. I remember having two girls, you know, in a toboggan going down there and they're, you know, brushing their hair back as they're going down the toboggan, still trying to look good for the ride, you know. So, you know, it's, uh, it's something that uh, continues today and it, and it started way, way back at that time. And that's kind of about the story of Highlands, that we always kept pushing things all the time. And the, the building itself, you know, the, the, the Cloud Nine building, you know, was, was a, a, a party scene in the 70s that rival in certain days, in certain days would rival even what's happening there today. It was all cheap wine, as Mad Dog 2020 and Spaniata. You know, it wasn't what Andreas brought and, and what Tommy's serving now, but it was, uh, you know, it was cold cuts, you know, <laughs> on sandwiches. But yet, still, that, that party atmosphere, that energy, and I think that's what it really is, is skiers have an energy that is, is uh, um, untold inside of themselves because there's, there's a life force in it. And so whenever you get to enjoy that with other people in their company and, and uh, have a party and to kind of describe your day, you kind of imagine it being back in the old days of the Limelight Lodge, you know, sitting in front of the fireplace with the St. Bernard. You know, that same type of thing happened back in the 50s. And then you see it happening in my time of the 70s and 80s in which it was the wine and cheese picnics up there. And now you see it with Andreas with uh, like starting with classical music and kind of ending with rock and roll on a day, but then it was always the stories being told at the table of while you're having a great meal. And then Tommy bringing it into, even to the next level in which the, the great meal is there for the, the, t the 12 o'clock seating and the two o'clock seating is pretty much about getting down and having a hard, hard, hardcore party. And I think that that energy is just, it's been in us since the conception of skiing and I think that we uh, get to live it every day, maybe a little bit different form now than what we had in the past. Well, particularly the two o'clock seating is the seating that we know that the people uh, get reservations for that because that's what they want. They want to still have a good meal. You know, they kind of get through that kind of quickly and then the champagne starts flowing and the champagne starts to get sprayed, the, 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 the dancing on the tables. I mean, it can get plain wild in there. And it's just guys having guys and gals having a great time for for uh, and just celebrating life. That's what it is. It's just celebrating life. You know, sometimes on the sunny days the deck will go off as well. It's not just indoors. You know, sometimes we have a uh, beautiful sunny days in the spring, particularly, and uh, and the whole deck will go off. And then at uh, the end of the the party, you know, there's a uh, there's a song that that they normally do, or, or you know, and the music is played up to a certain point, and then they say. You know, that's it, guys, you got to go home. And everybody chants, one more song, one more song. Of course, you already know that we're going to have to do this. So you make the one more song go on to satisfy the, the guests. They really go off at that point in time. Then it's like, OK, we got to get all these people out of, the, out of there. And people, when they're in such a great energy like that, don't move very fast because they're still telling stories. They're still, they're still living even the moments of the party. They're living moments of their day of skiing. They're living in the moments of, of just being in town. And, uh, and they always want pictures, you know. So as when, you're, when you're out there trying to help Tommy and those guys get people off the deck, you're constantly, you know, taking pictures of their groups and everything else to get them, their, their memories that they want to take with them. Um, uh, they're somewhat in disarray. Sometimes you see goggles on upside down. You'll see, you know, even occasionally a boot, a boot's put on backwards, you know, when they, when they get out to put in their skis. And, and you, you look at that and you have to judge what cap capability these people have. And 
Uh, sometimes you say, no, I think you might have been overserved or whatever, you know. And it's mainly because when they get outside, they don't feel like they are when they're inside. They don't really look like they are. When they get outside, it just kind of hits them a little harder. And they get into their skis, and you can kind of tell, no, nah, this isn't really going to be what they need to do to get down. And so we kind of put them alongside. We talk them into taking a snow cat down. Um, and back in the 70s, we had to talk them into getting in, into a toboggan. So it, it really hasn't changed all that much, you know. You kind of, you kind of evolve with it from the from the from the seventies all the way till now. Uh, it was a very short lived. We put a we put a brass pole in in the restaurant because of the dancing, and it was very short lived. It only lasted you know, a couple of weeks, but uh, um, actually, again, it just kind of adds to the crazy energy, you know. And it was. It was enjoyed by, uh, by a lot of different people. You think of uh, the brass pole as being more of a, uh, a women's uh, prop, but um, it was a prop for almost everyone. So it, it was, uh, I think it was well enjoyed. Andreas and ourselves were cohorts in the energy, I think. You know, we were still wishing that we were jumping. <laughs> You know, so that the party atmosphere that was going on over there was still something that was in, is in our blood. And uh, uh, to see it go on, it wasn't that un, unintended or unrealized uh, because it, we, we'd seen it in the, in, the, in the wine and cheese picnics at certain times. So... If it goes all the way to where it was then, it was just, I don't know, a different class. But then that's what evolution is. You know, you see where skiers used to be skiing in their jeans and their, you know, the, the rawness of that. Heck, we, nobody, had a, nobody had a helmet on. Hell, they didn't even have a hat on, you know. They skied, in, they skied in sweaters and their jeans and that kind of stuff, you know. And now you see how this whole thing has moved forward with the kind of gear that we have, you know, the base layers and the... Uh, all the different kinds of skis that we have, um, you know, everything moves forward, it, you know, and I think that uh, we as a company, we need to just continue to ride that wave and be in the forward tip of that because uh, um, it's not going to change. And I think that that energy of that place will continue to go in a direction of whatever the direction of our humanity is, you know, and whatever skiers want it to be. I think the reputation of Cloud9 will still go through ebbs and flows. You know, I think that it'll go through times in which we go maybe too far or maybe not as uh, um, grassroots as it, as it really could be and might drift off for a little while. And then it'll probably have a rebirth again. Because I've seen it for a lot of years go through those same kinds of cycles, you know, and uh, I think that's, that's probably inevitable. Well, we have. We've seen, even again, you can step it clear back to when it was a wine and cheese picnic. You know, you had Cher and Sonny Bono up there. And so you start with that kind of a, a grassroots effect. Even before that, Highlands was known with the, the Smothers Brothers. You know? so they used to <laughs> perform at the bottom, of the, the bottom of the hill. You know, the limelighters were there. The, you know, and, uh, you know, where uh, Nitty Gritty Dirt Band was, you know, if you would play at the base lodge. And so... When you really think of Highlands, you can kind of think of that this is this is kind of place where even in the base that they uh, they they had this this rudimentary energy as well that started, you know. So now it's just gotten brought up the hill, and so you see people like Seal and uh, DiCaprio and and uh, and Farrell and, and you know all these guys up there having a great time, you know. Banderas, you know, a local, you know. And there's a lot of different locals that are in this community that, you know, you, you see up there and you see them in their ski clothes and they're just like the rest of us. And so I think what they're there for is just to enjoy that same energy, you know, just to feel that, you know, just have that feeling for that moment that this is what it's all about is, uh, is us enjoying life and it's, uh, it comes together in a, at the cloud nine. <laughs> yeah, I do have a lot of memorable stories, you know, to, to, uh, you know, to being when we started to jump the deck, you know, with the, with the uh, the program, the uh, uh, the person that started that whole thing was Skip Gilkerson. He came from Cypress Gardens, and he put on a water ski show. And he said, "Hey, we could put on a show here." And I, I think Whip, being the entrepreneur that he was, 
said, man, that sounds good to me. And so then they started to do an actual show with the, with the guys jumping in which we would jump uh, uh, one at a time. Then we'd come up and we'd exit. One time we had nine patrollers in the air at the same time. Um, some guys started jumping with the rig, you know, over the deck. Uh, Doug Driscoll was the first one in the, in the show. I think there was somebody even before me and before he jumped that small deck that was out there in front uh, before that time. But, uh, uh, and then I started jumping with the rig, you know, and I jumped it for 11 years, you know, 80 times a year, you know, and to, to sometimes come up short because the snow is sticky and, you know, uh, crash the, the toboggan on the deck and have it fold over and and uh, that really entertained the crowds anytime there's a wreck you know the, the crowd really gets excited about it um, but the most of the main stories that are really come out of there are um, just relationships that get to be built you know and it can be uh, just two people meeting because they have the same thing in common for that moment of being skiing and their friendships begun there I know lots of people in which they they met their significant others there. You know, um, there's there's tons of uh, of of uh, night one night stands. I'm sure that come out of there. <laughs> it's 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 it is just the kind of energy that we look for as human beings. You know, and we like to have fun. And luckily, the whole town of Aspen has that reputation of just having fun. And uh, I think the cloud nine is the, the cherry on the top. When we, we actually, the very first time we started doing our show, we actually had our guests on picnic tables and they're actually eating underneath us and we jumped over them. And we did that for almost a season. I don't know if we had as many as 80 shows that year, but we had a lot of shows. And uh, Lloyd's of London was the provider, the insurance provider for WIP, and they came up there and said, yeah, I don't think we want that to be in. I don't think we want to take that exposure. So then we had to move the, move the guests off to the side in order to continue our show. But, and oh, you, see, so cool. you see people that aren't professional partiers that just really, just, they can't believe they're in this scene. You know? <laughs> they're, you know, they're, they're there for the first time, the only time maybe that they'll be there. And they can't believe that they got an opportunity to be in that kind of energy, you know. And why? I don't know. You know, we should they they should they should know it's there at some point in time. Just you know, go fly fishing. You find that energy at certain times. You know, if you any kind of a sport in which you have this camaraderie that that builds, you're going to have that. And for some of these people, for it to being their first time is, it's almost shocking to me because I live my life in it. You know, but. These people, are, they go, come out of there just saying, this is the most fun I've had in my lifetime. And isn't that really interesting to hear that? And hear, it, I'd say, daily, you know, because I'm down there quite often to, to help, you know, just examine people going out to see if they need any help. And I'd say it's a daily occurrence in which I have people come to me and say, this is the best thing they've ever done, you know, so, you know. We see people take tremendous efforts to get up there because it's a ski in, ski out. Uh, um, place and you'll see people that will uh, particularly women who will go down there and uh, rent snowboards or skis at the bottom never been on a snowboard never been on skis take the snowboard ski go to the bottom of the exhibition lift ride up the lift with their board their skis in their hand get atop the of exhibition sometimes just walk to the bottom of cloud nine lift you know and and get themselves up they have to put their skis on at the bottom of nine or they won't load them you know so they put their skis on at the bottom of nine and then they get up they fall off the ramp at the top of nine they walk down there and this 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 effort that they put into it is just amazing you know i've seen people rent at gear that have no no business being on at gear that they'll start rather than taking a lift because they hear that you really have to be able to ski up there and the lift won't load you so they say oh i'll just walk up there so they get this AT gear on and they start skiing up and they're all dolled out. And guess what? They got their skins on backwards. And so their skins are slipping on the bottom of, of, of uh, um, Jerome down there and they can't figure out how to do it. And it's just, it's, sometimes it's, it's very comical. It's entertaining. It's, okay, now you got to take your skis off. Let's switch them around this way. So and then they'll grip, you know, and you watch it. Oh, this is how it works. They're, they get wore out before they even get to midway though. <laughs> <laughs> they very seldom make it to cloud nine, but they try to put out that effort <laughs> to do it. Um, we did. We did about. We had about 50 seats, 45, 50 seats inside, and on the deck we started a little bit later, 
Um, in the year, we had another 50 seats. So in reality, you had about 100 seats. So in a, in a very marginal outfitted uh, operation, we really had to kind of uh, put that together uh, to, be able to, to be able to produce something well. Uh, same as on the beverage side, we, you know, we, 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 took <coughs> we took some, uh, you know, three, three bottles of red wine, three bottles of white wine, you know, in a very, very fairly priced uh, matching the prefix menu, which usually came with a soup or a salad, um, changing the soup to the seasonalities, and then one vegetarian dish, one meat dish uh, to the serve. So that was a fairly, fairly small outfit. It was not really with a lot of glamour, but it was well cooked, and uh, we uh, we put a lot of efforts in it. So uh, with that, uh, with that said, um, people really start liking the simplicity. And, uh, you know, having a couple of glasses of good wine, it's not necessarily a box wine, it's some really nice, uh, um, you know, bottled wine uh, out of California and, um, uh, you know, international one. We saw, I saw very quick that people do look for more. So after the first year, we knew that the game was on, uh, people explored us. Um, and I remember when I when I bought my my first bottle of Opus One, I, I was like, "Wow, that 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 really you know there are people really here to to go for it." So that really changed changed the game fairly drastically. That there were customers they really looked for a different experience, which we were able to provide. We knew that uh, we had to get a couple capital expenditures since there were uh, there's a market there's a market for it uh, people looked for different experience um, we we had a very flimsy stereo up there which we actually took over from the ski patrol and it was like two speakers and you know we created a scene where we only play classical music so that really was a you know that was very unique. You just you just didn't have that, and you had a, a good glass of wine, and you had a good a good 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 plate of food. So it created this uh, this classic environment in some way. So obviously the classic changed occasionally into modern rock and into disco music, and whatnot. And and one of the best capital expenditures, besides obviously um, put some different stoves and kitchen infrastructure in it. Um, we 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 had to we had to buy different stereo because people looked for more quality music. We blew speakers every week. I believe that was one of the best capital expenditures. Besides, we grew very quick, and the infrastructure didn't help. The culinary infrastructure didn't help the growth of uh, demand of customers. So. We had this menu engineer, and we are, uh, I think we got it figured out. And um, we needed to find a different way because the kitchen got too small. It got too, you know, it got not ready for that volume. So we said, you know, watch this, guys. We're going to buy raclette, and we're going to get fondue. And we let the customer cook it himself, and we charge him double. Easy. So that was that was that was actually a great concept. It really worked out because people really liked it. It just it just get off the handle. The only problem was raclette oven needs a lot of power, electrical power. So with that raclette ovens, we blew fuses probably every five minutes of the service. Uh, we did have some very good support from our higher ups and from the ski company in general and uh, we got infrastructures supported with higher power IT lines um, and upgrade we had a very great mountain manager at that time and he really he really supported us because he saw the value he saw the value of what can be and what can be done. So now you've got the building and the, and the, the concept and the infrastructure. And so tell me how this restaurant 
takes off and, and how it gets its reputation. <clears throat> so we had that lunch part figured out. We obviously amped up um, our menu. We changed it frequently. We had the culinary part very well, very well set. Uh, our wine list increased drastically into definitely a higher, a higher grade and quite elaborate international wine list. Uh, there was always the attitude if you want to have a wine which I don't have, no problem. Give me a credit card. I have it for you. Uh, you know, there was not really any, any, any wine cellar or any, any, any temperature controlled. So I, I had I had to stay in a certain I had to stay in a, stay in a certain range plus inventory uh, on a higher end you had to be certainly uh, uh, careful as well. So if somebody didn't want to have the wine, it's like no problem. You come back in three days. I make a reservation to you today. You give me a credit card. I sip it through and I have the wine for you. And that's what we did. That's really how it changed up. People really did like it. It was very unpretentious. Uh, I really didn't care if it was a blue collar. It was any class, how many chairs the guy has, or you know how many ski bombs I had. You know, for me, everybody was a very, very welcome customer, and I did like that. It was just not about the game to make a higher revenue; it's just to have a game and have a good time with it. So, with that also, it really changed that there's a different clientele came in, um, and a huge game changer was that I had a. I had a very well said client that's like, you know what? I want to do a dinner. I'm like, wait a minute, you're going to do a dinner? That's not bad. So we had to figure out, obviously, how you're going to get people up the hill or get people down the hill. So you needed snow cats, you needed ski patrollers, you needed safety. So you got a whole thing going on. Uh, all of a sudden, you change from a day operation into a night operation. So we tried it out and it was it was very much a success. However, well wait a minute, we need a approval for that too, right? <laughs> so we 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 had to kind of pedal back a little bit and get this whole thing approved and um, and again a, a great support from uh, from our uh, executive staff and I remember when we we were sitting in front of the county commissioners and everybody was like I don't know about this thing you know it was kind of how are you gonna do that <laughs> so we had to really put out a good plan a good emergency plan and um, we we did start it out with three dinners which are private dinners which we sold and. Again, totally different clientele came in. Uh, everything was off the chart, custom-made menus, five course, six course, wine, champagne. It was a, just a totally different feel. And it was cool, it was sexy. Plus it was cool, it was cold as well because the snow cat was open. So it was actually the ski patrol cat which we used to transport people up to the bowl for their skiing experience during the day. We used it at night. So well, you know, at night in a January with a snowstorm could be very cool experience for sure. Pictures started going out all over the world, you, it was said, about 2005, 2006. Uh, champagne sales skyrocketed. And you, you uh, this is a quote from you, we had to keep people safe from themselves. Can you talk about that period of time? So, <clears throat> obviously, the success and the game changer was that we had a different clientele up there. We changed already. We were very well known uh, of where we are. There was a time where the ski patrol moved out of the building, and that we found out. I think just before we opened, or we were open already. So all of a sudden, I inherited a whole building by itself and a whole room by itself. And we did not really have a concept again with that. So what came really out there is the typical European hot warming hot. 
So uh, to do this in a last minute scale, we just took a chainsaw, cut a vendor in it, put a refrigerator, put a cash register, and make a soup salad. And you come in with your own food. It was just very casual. And that was the Cloud9 soup bowl. Became an instant hit with obviously locals, also with tourists, hasn't been seen before. That was something, wow. So with that, different concepts, sit down, low key, warming hot. During the same time, the iPhone became a very important tool for many people. Cannot live without it anymore. So um, we had this saying, it happens at Cloud9, it stays at Cloud9. But then the iPhone came and everything changed since people liked it, made pictures, posted on Facebook, whatever was out there, so that media by itself was quite frankly one of the best marketing tools we ever had. We could not we could not we could not spend the money what on marketing, what just people sent out the pictures and uh, where they are and how cool it is and how cool the setting is and how unpretentious look at see you know it, it was it was fantastic and there was literally literally every class of people were sitting together and having a party and that was that was very very that was very fulfilling it doesn't really create an environment for an upper class or lower class it was classless and the whole place was actually classic so with that with that thing um, it really did change the iPhone put us on a success rate for sure what were people taking pictures of that were so captivating what was I mean a, a picture doesn't tell the story of people's class what, what was going on uh, so you know with that obviously uh, in the afternoon on a sunny afternoon on deck things can get quite spirited um, you know, we certainly had you know some some nice uh, drinks. We uh, had certainly some good wine lists with people really indulged themselves, and it just you know it was it was it was unpretentious. People danced on the tables. Finally, we figured out uh, after I don't know how many speakers and how many stereos, but finally we figured out that we really have a good place and a good stereo, and you know the place became a party. Uh, and it really became a party at uh, you know three o'clock, two thirty. We didn't choreograph it. There were people just wanted to having a good time. Um, we didn't have any. We had some basic music, but mostly people brought their own music because they had the they had uh, the iPad came out at that time. I was out there, and people were lining up to put their music preloaded and play that. It was it was a big hit. So we had to actually start working on it. 50 minutes, okay, 50 minutes your iPad, 50 minutes your iPad, because people were lining up and they really wanted to get that. So it, 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 it was, it, all of a sudden became, it became, a, it became a good party, it really did. It was never really, again, choreographed, it just exploded. You know, we had this group over here and here were the Australians and here were the New Zealanders and here were the Brazilians and here were the locals and all of a sudden this place exploded out of nowhere. And that was, that was good, very cool. You started with this, Let's go back. How many people f first started going there, and now you have to book months in advance, and uh, it's packed all the time. How many dinners or lunches do you serve? Um, and and per square foot, it's probably one of the most successful restaurants in in Aspen, right? Can you kind of paint, paint mm -hmm. that picture? If you if you really look at the statistics or in the restaurant industry, I, Cloud Nine breaks it all. There's no doubt about it. Uh, first of all. Um, check average is very high, food is very high, and you really can choose of how big of a wine you want to drink, how much champagne you want to drink. So that's, that's a huge, that's obviously, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's big. With the growth of the business, with the growth of people, we, and customers, we had we had a huge reservation list uh, going on there. Um, people wanted to come in. They called 
in the summertime already for December reservations. Uh, dinner became obviously a very big hotspot. Again, we started out with three, we ended up with 50, and I don't know how many of the guys I have up there now. Uh, it just became a place to be, to have a party up there. And uh, obviously, we had some fantastic, fantastic staff members. And I have to say, every day they make this happening up there. You have the picture, you're at 11,000 feet. You have about 300 people dancing on chairs, dancing on tables, try to do, um, you know, try to have a party. And then you try to serve food and, you know, serve wine and, uh, and do your job. That really takes a certain breed of, uh, of, uh, of uh, employees and, and, and staff members. And over the years, it was, it was absolutely fantastic from uh, what, we, what we have. There's many still up there. And, uh, you know, for the chefs up there, it was, uh, it was definitely an eye-opener. Then this is not just cooking. Well, you cook at 11,000 feet. You know, a gallon of water takes a little longer to cook than on sea level. So it certainly, it certainly gave quite a few chefs the, the eye-opener of, uh, of what can be on challenges, what can be up there. Um, <clears throat> do you have famous people that come up there? Do you have, uh, you don't have to name anybody. If you wanted to name somebody, you could. But uh, isn't it one of the most coveted dining experiences in town? I mean, if people are going to come to town, they're going to go to five places. Maybe they go to Pine Creek. Maybe they go to wherever, Cash Cash. But they also want to go to Cloud Nine. And can you talk a little bit about that? And uh For us, we did not make a differentiation. Everybody who came to the door was famous. Everybody who came up there wanted to be with us and we honored them with a good service and with a good party, with a good food. So from the famous side, um, again, you were famous, you were up there. <laughs> uh, <coughs> the, uh, thank you. Uh, the, uh, I'm, I'm I'm, f I'm flattered. I'm famous in, on Woody Creek, maybe. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so you've been all over the world. You've seen restaurants all over the world. You've been on the QE2. <coughs> is this a total, put it in the reference of the world of dining. Is this an experience that people should have if, uh, if they appreciate uh, good food, a good atmosphere? Is this a unique restaurant? Is there nothing like it that you've seen anyplace else? Can you kind of uh, put it into perspective? So when we started, uh, I would say we were one of the first really sit-down gourmet dining, on-mountain dining in ski areas. Um, that was way before the other ski areas caught on and changed uh, some concepts. Um, you come to Aspen and you absolutely need to go and have a meal up at, uh, up at Cloud9. Since yes, unique setting, uh, unique product, and at the end of the day, unique opera ski. You really don't have that. You, you really don't have that anywhere in the States. It is, it is I would say, still on mountain. And I'm not talking about off mountain. Off mountain is a little different, but on mountain, 11,000 feet, it's a it's a different setting. And to create that, you have not seen that anywhere in North America. Uh, I would say even up to date. One of the things that you talked about was people started bringing uh, their their alcohol up in Camelbacks, and you you want to tell <laughs> that story a little bit. So. Obviously, with the opera ski, uh, the situation where where we where we been, it really it really became it became a place to party. It became a place to hang out. Uh, there were people were skiing in Aston Mountain in the morning, and they made sure they'd be over in Highlands at two o'clock because hey, there was a party going on at Cloud Nine every day. Obviously, iPhone, people texting, hey, Cloud Nine goes off. People leaving Aspen, hopping over to uh, hopping over to to Highlands and and uh, having a party time. So reality is 
there are people that can party and there are people that think they can party. So you're going to put that whole thing in a mix at 11,000 feet. Well, it's a pretty explosive, pretty dangerous uh, situation in some way. So reality is we, we, we did have to protect people from themselves, not getting too stupid on it. Um, with, uh, with that said, we did have to change uh, certain setups. And, um, you know, I remember very well when we kind of had a, a hard liquor, I would say hard liquor ban, since people really couldn't hold that. And, and you know, I kind of try to figure out why these guys are all getting so boosted up and, and what's going on there. So I had, this, I had this spot where you really can oversee the masses. And I, I checked this group out, and they all went to the same camera bag and all drank from the same camera bag. So, well, these guys got into the dancing, and I checked on the camel bag as well. Everclear, vodka, all this good stuff. So, we certainly had to change and, again, protect people from themselves in some ways. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's not always fun to collect, um, you know, collect people and get them off the hill, which, you know, put a lot of pressure on the ski patrol. It still does. And uh, um, it's, it always puts a lot of reliability on everybody who serves alcohol and also who, who, you know, who, who jumps in a car down at the base. So we certainly had to change a couple of things. Um, again, if somebody wants to get drunk, you get drunk. You know, there's no doubt about it. You cannot probably prevent that. At, at some point you decided to leave and you, you turned the business over to Tommy. Uh, can, you, can you talk about that decision and, and then what, <laughs> what it meant to turn it over to someone else. So, after that extended time, um, you know, I'd be, I'd be over 35 years in corporations. Uh, I kind of looked for something different in my future, in my future career. And it had certainly nothing to do with the company. I needed to do something for my own, which uh, I got a very good opportunity to build a, to build and buy a restaurant uh, in Carbondale, which uh, I, I lived there since quite a long time. I know the locals quite well. Uh, and I really enjoyed that to create something different. And obviously, it was on my own. So a uh, time came where we really had to make a decision as a family and say, like, OK, well, we're not going to go into the corporate far further. We're going to do our own, little, uh, our own little business, which we did. Um, this this site and this restaurant is so unique with all these little quirks and logistics and and, 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 and and players involved that you really needed to find the right person for that. Um, I believe it ran a year or two years without a manager. And then there was a gentleman, he had a restaurant in, in town uh, was very well known, was also of European descent, understood the mountain, and um, he did apply for the job. And that was the guy right from the beginning where I thought, you know, he, he, he's the guy who can put it off. He really is. Um, with, all the, with all the little things out there, I think he has the stamina, he's, he's able to put it off. And he did it for, I believe, the last, what, the last seven years or six years now. So good job on that. Tommy, uh, Tommy took that thing over. I think he learned a lot in the first um, couple of years. And now he's enjoying the ride, I guess. This is Legends of Aspen. I'm Tommy Tollison, and I've got some stories to tell. I grew up in Sweden, and um, when I grew up, skiing was a huge influence of everybody um, that I knew and knew of. Um, we, we had two TV channels, and one of them would show skiing in the winter, and, and uh, you know, we all wanted to be in our Stenmark growing up, and uh, we all wanted to go skiing. So I quickly knew that when I grew up, I wanted to be a ski bum. And uh, I went to Aspen for a ski season in my 20s and kind of came back a few times and uh, realized this place is pretty incredibly awesome and I want to stay and try to figure out a way to make that happen. And what was it that struck you 
uh, in such a way that you it was incredibly awesome and you wanted to stay. I mean, there are lots of ski areas. Mm -hmm. what, what about what about Aspen makes Aspen Aspen? Um, I think the people um, are incredibly friendly. I think the people are unlike European ski resorts. Um, I know a friend of mine from Chamonix and he said his, <coughs> his parents have lived there for 90 years and they're not locals because they're not born here, but here you live for two years and you're locals in a, in a way because everybody's some, from some place and everybody's got a different story and we all need to make friends and need to, to connect and it, it makes the place very open. And the summers, I think, kind of got me, um, or really, truthfully, the fall this time of year, which is really like Swedish summer, um, <coughs> temperature-wise. And um, I thought this place is just, it's, it's too much fun. I came to do, I came to ski, not to have a career in that sense. And, and uh, um, I quickly figured out that restaurants are the places that are typically open at night that allows you to ski during the day. And, um, and so I did a typical ski bum story where I washed dishes, bus tables, and then served and bartended and eventually managed and opened my own restaurant and that sort of, sort of thing. But it wasn't like <clears throat> I came here to pursue an idea or a concept. I just came here to ski and have a good time. So tell me a little bit about elevation and how that prepared you for what what happened? I mean, you ran that restaurant for a long time. It was a, a successful enterprise. Sure. Um, yeah, I had a restaurant for 13 years and um, was incredibly fun and great in many ways. Um, what I didn't have that Cloud9 has is, is a AAA location and uh, um, sort of a, something that set us apart from the competition. So when I was down there, sort of stuck in a basement to a degree, I was always searching for for ways to create business and to, to improve and and I, ch I don't know how many things I try to change to make make things better and and you know after 13 years just kind of just hanging out hanging on by a thread and then it was it was time to move on and uh, the next move was good for me well let, let's talk about the next <coughs> move and uh, how how you were talking about you went back to Europe you told me you went back to Sweden to kind of chill out for a summer and figure out what things tell me that story and how you heard about the, an opening at cloud nine and so on yeah so 13 years running my own restaurant it was sort of my identity in many ways um, elevation and and after that i did some soul searching i went back to sweden and to try and figure out what what i was going to do and sort of heard by some former staff of mine from Elevation that were now working at Cloud9 that they were looking for a um, general manager and um, I always loved that place and I, you know, I contacted the uh, ski company and said, um, you know, introduced myself and said, this is me and this is, uh, um, you know, I think I think it, it would be a good fit. I have some, some visions that are in line with what you've been doing, but sort of emphasize um, certain other things and and um, and went from there many interviews later I um, you know I got to uh, <clears throat> tell my strengths and weaknesses and um, certainly office side of things were not my strengths and still isn't um, I like to be hands-on I like to be where it is and and they were really looking for somebody to treat the play like place like it was his or her own place and and that very much appealed to me and uh, I'm still very much treating it like it was mine what was it about cloud nine before you went there that excited you about going there what what I mean other restaurants you might have said that's ah, not a, I don't care but cloud nine was something special in your mind tell me why well I always I was always a highland skier um, I always liked the sort of the raw, rough element. Uh, um, it was, in my opinion, a very local, down and dirty place sort of thing. And prior to ski company with the old lifts and, you know, we would um, 
sidestep pack snow pack for a couple hours to get a day pass and and that sort of thing and and uh and there was this little cabin i used to be patrol shack and the location is just it's out of this world right i mean it's just it's just so pretty and um but it's not just like any other restaurant where you drive up in valley park you actually have to earn you have to pay your dues to get there you know you really have to learn how to ski uh, and it's not a beginner mountain you have to be a you know who should should be a decent skier to make there to to make it there and and, and most of the time when i ever splurge to go to cloud nine i i hiked the pole i did something so already my day was like one of the best days of my life when i walk into the restaurant and then i'm like wow this is you know andreas would be there and it's just this distinct european flair and the, the views and the, you know you were in heaven before you even started eating the food food that's incredibly good as well so you're starting way ahead as opposed to um a few steps behind where i was starting running a restaurant in the basement. So you come on board and you look at this place, it's very successful. I had a few few weeks to, to prepare for when, when I took over and I, I, um, I quickly knew that one of the things that I really enjoyed with the place and has, has proven to be very successful is the, the late afternoon party aspect of things. No, it's by far not the only thing that that a lot of people seem to think, but but it is a it's a big part of what Cloud Nine is, and 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 to do that, um, to make that happen, I I, I made three specific changes. Um, one was to get a sound system that was up to par, and we actually since upgraded again a couple of times, and this time we think we have it right, but. Um, um, the other one was to change the seatings. Um, you used to be able to come at, at you know, one o'clock and sit for a long afternoon. And, and uh, um, partially I wanted to maximize seating. So I turned it into two seating so we can get as many people as we possibly could. And I also wanted to, I wanted to make sure that the people that came at two o'clock stayed till the end because it's sort of a, um, it's sort of a lunch and a show, if you will. You know, so um, if you if you came at one and sometimes, be, you know, you have a half empty restaurant by the end of by the end of um, end of the lunch. And I wanted to keep everyone there till the end to really experience the whole whole thing. And then um, I also um, I wanted to make I wanted to make things easy up there and, 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 and make champagne the obvious choice um, I'd seen perfectly course marketing campaign around and what they done on Aspen and they had a very you know strong profile already and I, I went to them with a vision and I said listen I here's what I want to do um, I had no idea it was going to go as far as it did but but um, you know I would like for you to uh, make me an ice bar and now they made us a permanent bar because the ice bar kept melting um, and uh, I'm going to need some buckets and I'm going to need a lot of things to so when we're busy we don't have to explain to people that this is the champagne restaurant it's now very much associated with with cloud nine and what we do um so those were sort of the the three main things and i've done up you know i I'm, I'm constantly thinking about ways to to change or improve or better the restaurants as i think we should always think about our, ourselves in that way but but um um I'm pretty happy with the way things are going at the moment, but should never be, you know, should never stand still and never be stagnant. You know, to tell you the truth, I really do not have the exact number of, of how, how much champagne we go through. I have heard that we are um, the number one account in, in North America and obviously big hotels and in hotels in Vegas are gonna be a bigger account than, than us for a small independent restaurants or or if it's for the four months we're open. I'm not sure about all of those statistics, but I know we are a very significant um, <clears throat> account of champagne in general and Verve Clicquot specifically. And there's several hundred cases that are um, that we go through in, um, if not thousand um, plus cases uh, in a season. And not all that champagne gets swallowed. Do you wanna tell me about that and what, 
the, 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 the rain shower of champagne that tends to happen. I think the whole champagne spraying thing started in, with Formula One, as far as I know. Well, it, was, it had started and, and, it, and it was getting increasingly popular when I was there and, and, um, and uh, one thing, we used to have Prosecco and Cava and all these sparkling things for $50. I'm like, you're gonna, spray, you're gonna spray me in the face, you're gonna pay for it. And the moment I took away those things and upped the game to, to make an inevitably close to the entry level, that, then it just tripled and quadrupled. It was, this wasn't a, you know, something that I, I did on purpose, but people were like, wow, it's, you know, they're really spraying champagne up there and it's not beer and soda and it's not just a frat party, it's something, yes, it's a lot of excess and, and, and you can definitely put, put arguments to that, but, but it is, the way it happened is a very short period of time and it, is, it really is incredibly fun at the time. Um, I will say this, that, you know, I'm very happy to say that this year we got a, um, finally a um, filtration system up there so we don't have to import water from France and Italy. We actually um, have a, a great filtration system where we, um, so we can limit, limit waste and those sort of things. Because there are aspects about Cloud9 that's, that's wasteful, but it's not, it's not who we are, it's not who Ski Company is. And it's, it's you know, um, it's a small part of things, but it is, it's, a, it's a fun element. I've been lucky enough that a lot of the staff has been there a long time, and, 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 and that obviously they know a lot of the staff more or better than I do and, and uh, have a relationship with them and, and each other and, and somehow somehow it works. It's, but it is touch and go. You do get, um, you know, people are there dancing in ski boots and you get kicked in the chin and you get stamped on your feet and sometimes sprayed on your face. We were using um, raclette machines that are hot. Um, it's very, very, tight corners and and you got to get sometimes i see them stapling soup bowls on on piles and i'm like don't don't do it and and you know knock on wood it's we haven't had too too many accidents with with uh, food or anything else people are um attentive and on point and and you know but it is it is every day it's 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 a new day and and uh has unique challenges but um we uh I'm very, very uh, pleased and proud of my, my staff to go through what they, what they do. Isn't it one of the most sought after jobs in town? Isn't it one of the most lucrative jobs in town um, uh, to, to get to be a waiter there? I mean, you can make a pretty damn good living, I think. As far as, as, far as restaurant job goes, I think it's, uh, it's definitely up there. I do, I do get asked almost daily by friends and acquaintances for for a job at cloud nine and for good and bad no one nobody ever leaves so uh that's typically my standard answer that you know that's uh it's a very very small turnover but yeah it's a it's a it's a desired position in many ways but it's it's certainly not an easy one so what do you see for the for the future now <coughs> what what kinds of things might you want to add or change um, and can the aura, the energy uh, of Cloud9 be sustained? Does it have to get bigger all the time, or what, what do you think? Um, I don't think Cloud9 should, should ever get bigger. I, I, I think it couldn't even if it wanted to. I think the footprint's what it is. We did our remodel when we changed that. Uh, um, the restroom and gave everybody a view and that's important um, so growing in that sense um, every year I think we're not gonna we're not gonna grow anymore because we're already maxed out and every year we have grown our revenue but but I, I think we're really um, <coughs> we're not gonna s you're not gonna see a lot of empty seats in there or you haven't the last couple of years and and um, um, so as far as growth um, I think that's, I, I don't think that's in the future necessarily. Um, 
I don't think that's a goal to franchise or to do more Cloud9. I think it's, it's, it's what it is. It's a very unique place. Um, Andreas and the, and the crew from initially built a fantastic place and, and I've added my element and, and um, um, what it will look like in, in five or 10 years, I, I don't know. I think everything is changing and, and people's um, needs might change and people's view, but I really, I really like to think and hope that there will be a, um, a beautiful restaurant at that, that location. And, uh, and I don't see any reasons why, why, why they wouldn't. Can you tell me about the kind of clientele you have? Um, th uh, it seems to me it's, it's a must do experience now. So you must get celebrities, big time business people, um, famous athletes, whatever. Yes, absolutely. I don't necessarily want to speak about specifically who gets there, but there we have some, I mean, world famous, whether they are, um, athletes, uh, musicians, politicians um, in the public sector, you know, from the biggest companies in the world, there's, there's people, there's just models and there's all this, I mean, you name it. And then there's the, the skiers that, that, you know, started Cloud9 and, and, and who I've known for forever and, and or not necessarily billionaires or, or famous outside of Aspen, but they're, they were there to, to build it from the ground up and, and are you know, equally as important as, as anyone else. And, and then, there's a, then there's a third element of, of people that, you know, my favorite is um, when Ski Patrol stopped a couple of girls from, I don't know if they were from South Carolina or Alabama or you know, someplace, trying to hike up the mountain in high heels and they're like well, and where do you think you're going I'm like we're going to cloud nine and I don't think I don't think so like not, not you're not hiking up to cloud nine in high heels uh, not hiking up there period and they're like well who is the best part in North America we got to get there and, and I, I think that's the third side I think there's people that just heard that you have to go to cloud nine for some reason and and you know they don't know about skiing or care about skiing or care what it is that just here you have to be there and and they're also welcome you know <laughs> i i <laughs> whoever wh whoever it is for whatever reason uh we get a lot of incredibly interesting characters and people and and uh and that's a big part what why i love my job when people ask me how aspen's changed i say in the 60s maybe into the 70s. It was a town without social stratification. You'd go to a party and the mayor would be there and the editor of the newspaper and a doctor and a ski patrolman and a lift operator because they were all fly fishing buddies or whatever it was. Now in this town, it doesn't seem to me it works the same way. There's this class and this class and this class and they're more isolated. So I think what you've created there is maybe the great mixing bowl, if you will, of all of Aspen, and it's the one place you have what I'll call a really genuine Aspen experience. Does that make any sense? I mean, that, do you want to talk about yeah. that? I mean, you know, when I came here in in '86, and I've been here for a couple of weeks, and I remember the first thing that stuck with me was someone saying that I'm 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 leaving town. It's gotten to be too glitzy. It's not what it was. Um, I'm getting out, and while that probably was true in 86, um, it might be more true in 2017, 2018. But at the same time, I think that the mountains are still the same. And, 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 and a lot of people, when you get to know them, really are still the same. And, and at Cloud9, you know, everyone's in their ski gear and everybody has to make it to this remote town called Aspen, to this remote mountain called Aspen Highlands and ski up there. And then once you conquer those two things, you have to be lucky enough to get a reservation and get into cloud nine and people have to go down. You know, people are extremely humble and, 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 and nice from, and you can't tell in 
in their ski gear how well off they are and and most of the most people really don't care and 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 and, and that that's nice and it's it's really how it, it should be could you have a better job if you're going to have a job could i have a better job <laughs> um if i was going to be employed by somebody else which i guess is definition of a a job i don't know if self-employed i guess it's still a job um no I'm, I'm i'm definitely uh um you know as long as i'm i'm doing restaurants and you know i i like to think and hope that i'll be involved with restaurants for a long time to come i i i i, I think that cloud nine is 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 definitely uh hard if not impossible to beat so yeah no i'm i'm very happy where i am what's your advice to people who want a reservation so if you do want a reservation at Cloud9, um, well, I mean, my advice is first and also to look at, you know, what's what's your number two, three, four, and five option as opposed to I got to be there at New Year's Eve at, at two o'clock. Um, and you say, well, Saturdays and Sundays go fairly quickly at two o'clock. Um, um, but there's really no difference for a Tuesday, Wednesday, or a Thursday. So you know, try to get in those times. Um, we do. We don't release. We don't release the bookings until 30 days out. Um, so get on open table by by midnight, Mountain Time, and um, punch and try to be be lucky. And and if not, um, <coughs> oftentimes it works to to ski by. If you happen to be skiing up there and and know that you're going to be at Highlands um, and you really want to eat there and you can't get through and you can't get a reservation and I get it it's hard and I I wish we could help you more often than we do but the people that end up being on the mountain stick their head in and be like we're going to be where there's there's four of us we'd love to be to eat there then a lot of times we can do it um, and then you know noon is a lot easier to get in um, that's not the crazy party scene necessarily. It's a great, great, beautiful lunch. And I also say that uh, the night events are, are super fun as well, and they're, they're typically easier to, to get into. If you have a good group to, to come up at night, that's beautiful. You don't have to ski. Um, so there are, there are several options, but uh, one way or another, if you're here for more than a few days, then typically try to find a way t for you to get in there but uh, we just we can only take so many reservations it's a small little cabin you can always sit outside as well and it's not something you're gonna get in our neighbor town of Vale or other places it's it's something that is is uniquely Aspen and we're very happy and proud to be be able to say that and, and to be part of the Aspen community you know Highlands is a renegade area. It really is. It's a unique place. It is a place where you can relax, you can eat good food, you can drink good wine, you can party, you have to ski down, you just be up in a different environment. And uh, that's really what a lot of people are coming for. They can be themselves. Uh, we, we made sure there is not a... Uh, um, you know, we made sure there's not any, um, you know, any people clashing with, clashing with each other. I think everybody has his, um, has his place to be, it doesn't matter where. And I think that makes it unique for sure. Cloud9 is, is, you can't say so unique, because that's not, it's just, it is just unique. It's unique to um, the sport of skiing. And I think it encompasses everything from its history of, the 30s of this town through today and it it all comes together in a celebration of our sport I believe in that building in the end of the day and you get to see that kind of energy like you don't get to see it anywhere in the world.
a celebrated skier, folks, and qualified to smirk. I've skied more hills than any man from Frisco to New York. But talking about the skiing I've done is my one and only quirk, especially when I'm...